Hello, everyone. I am Heather with Magnificent Mamas, and we want to thank you for joining our Magnificent Authors podcast today. We are joined today with Devin Richards. Devin, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there. I'm Devin Richards. I'm a writer, uh, primarily a screenwriter, but I am also a fantasy author from Toronto, Canada. Awesome. Well, welcome, and thank you for being on our show today. Quite happy to be here. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the books that you've wrote? Well, the one full-length novel that I've written is called Where All Roads Lead. Uh, it's kind of a mishmash of fantasy genres in that it's a, a cozy fantasy uh, novel. It takes place all within one village within the kingdom, but it also brings in epic elements in that the basic premise is, is that your regular D&D party of uh, warrior mage uh, mm -hmm. Archer, blah, blah, blah. They are well past middle age. And the adventure that they have in chapter one nearly kills them. And so okay. they, yeah, so they, the adventure that they have, uh, leaving them with a, the little gold that they get out of it, they're like, look, uh, we, we can't do this anymore. We've got to do something else or we're going to die, which is something you never see in fantasy. Everyone's, 35 yeah. and immortal no matter what and so they go to set up a business in a town that they remembered fondly from their adventures across the countries turns out the town has a curse on it and that calls them back into action and so it turns from yes we're building a thing and making a life and it's very cozy and here's the potential for romance and da -da, the threat from beyond the beyond comes after them and uh they have to pick up their swords once again and become heroes, if only for the place they now call home. So there's so there's that, uh, where all roads lead. Uh, there is a story online, only online, which is a prequel that takes place seven years before, called The Mage's Dark Fate, and that is going to be amalgamated into the second edition of Where All Roads lead because it does have a lot of hints in regards to the the origin of the malevolent force in where all roads lead so people have said you know you should put those two together like make one the intro to the other that way uh there's a little less homework involved and i was like ah second edition of where all roads lead including the mage's dark fate will be coming out probably this fall Okay. Uh, and I also write detective fiction. Uh, I write um, the Damon Black mysteries, which take place in the underground and Toronto goth community. Uh, Damon Black is a Toronto elder goth who, you know, just by life circumstances, fell into the profession of private investigation. As you move through the dark underworld and through his cases, you're hearing it from a first person point of view. And the way that it fits into the noir genre is that the detective. Um, the detective is usually a character that does not develop. Mm -hmm. Their worldview is usually justified by the cases yeah. that they investigate. And, and because they're of that sort of darkly unique perspective, that's how they end up solving things, or at least handling. And so it carries on the neuro tradition. It's just that the detective is not gristled or hard-boiled or angry at the world because they fought in World War I or World War II, they are angry at the world because people have been cruel to them about their hair since the 1980s. And so they kind of have this insight into the into human nature in that, like, everyone pretends to be, like, good vibes only, but, like, if somebody who looks just a little bit different walks into the room, everyone turns into tribalistic savages. And this, this guy knows that. And yeah. so he understands, like, the thing is, is like the one thing that's brought up in just a bit of a paragraph is the idea that uh, there are no goth serial killers. Serial killers, when they want to adorn themselves in the clothing of a, of a normal human being, they, they go as far normal as humanly possible. They don't go as dark as humanly possible. Like there were the there was that one satanic panic death in the in the 1980s, the, but those people were not serial killers. They killed one person. Yeah, but that's the only example I can think of. Is the idea yeah. that uh, that you they can pack? Had... Well, I was just going to say that you can package yourself as the nicest, most normal-looking person in the entire world, and that's basically the thesis of the books. Is there's this guy who's you know like a an old urchin of the uh, of the old underground scene that you know has his worldview, and most of the time it turns out that he's right. 
but that's that's a noir formula. That sounds really interesting, and in like a different kind of perspective, sort of. It just to renew uh, renew the genre. Like the thing is, is in the in the nineties during the um, during the goth revival, there were a lot of books out, Dresden Files, that kind of thing, yep. where wherein people people main characters of a gothy bent fought monsters and this and like oh the ethereal and and that sort of thing and i wanted to take it in a different direction i love noir um i love detective stories but the thing is is i wanted my detective to be somebody who was grizzled and set in their ways but their reason why was far more realistic like the the idea like you know monsters don't kick punk rock kids out of their house yeah. Their, own, their own parents do that like and that's and that's the world that we live in basically i myself was a like a, a latchkey kid a very disposable kid to my family and so like i know that these uh relationships that we call family values are it's it's advertising for politicians i agree i the most... same way i'd come home from school get myself a snack do my homework do my chores Home by myself till probably seven o'clock yeah. or so at least. Yeah, I, I like there's a there's a t-shirt out there that says what is the second part? It says Gen X uh, raised on hose water and lies or something like that on on hose water and oh it's raised on hose water and neglect which I can attest to. Um, I was thinking about it the other day. I was thinking about it the other day. There was uh, there was down the street from where i lived there was a destroyed candy factory i guess in the 1920s or 1930s it was a candy factory called smiles and chuckles and now uh when i was a kid this is like in the mid 1970s it was just a pile of rubble mm -hmm. a very large like it was a couple of city blocks large that's where the kids went and played the kids got hurt like every freaking day the parents didn't do anything about it like then the land to this day as far as i know is not paved over or developed or it's just literally a pile of like a, like a bomb site it's, it's, it's yeah it's rubble in the middle of a of a residential neighborhood anyway uh, that's i get it completely when i was younger i'd go to my grandma's for the summer and they're like two places down from her house and, the, and this is like a country neighborhood you know there was this old abandoned church and all the kids in the neighborhood would go and play there and go in the buildings and mess around and climb the trees and get hurt and spiders upon spiders. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like at the time, what parenting is today is not the same as it was back. And the thing is, is like, even, even if you had children, you were sort of, it was sort of like you were still on your own journey and the kids were just an accessory to that. And so the thing is, is that their safety and their emotional development were incredibly second. Yeah. And so like that character that I created uh, is very much a part of a part of that world grew up in that environment where they see uh, I never wrote anything about it in the the stories that I have published there's a on online there's two stories uh they're called uh two shots the Damon black mysteries and they're and so it's just two stories back to back sold as a a short ebook I think it's I think it's like maximum. like on Amazon yeah but or anywhere else that you can get ebooks. I don't limit yeah. my publishing to Amazon. In the case of Where All Roads Lead, you can walk into any bookstore and order it. Can't find it on the shelf, but you can order it through the Ingram Spark system and get a printed copy yeah. there. Or you could get it printed by Amazon, or you could go to another venue. You could go to Apple Books, you could go to anywhere. Like it's it's basically available uh, throughout the world through as many different venues as possible. I did a lot of research before I published. I researched uh, a the, lot of uh, people rush in. Well, I did rush in. Like that's why I'm doing the second edition. Because what I'm what I'm doing is, is I'm combining the uh, the short story and the book. Then I'm also doing a lot of corrections. I'm I'm going through the book literally with a pen, wiping out lines and and changing words and this that the other thing. People, if people would be looking forward to a fantasy story like that. Mm -hmm. uh, reading something like that, I would highly recommend. Let's say as a teaser, they grab uh, the, the mage's dark fate just to introduce himself to the characters and then wait until fall of this year to to grab a copy of the second edition of Where All Roads Lead. Because the yeah. thing is, this, the thing is, this like the, the, the first edition, uh, I would imagine like having an having an autograph copy of the first edition would make it more valuable. But the thing is, is it's ne after this fall, it's never going to exist again. 
Uh, that makes sense. I've seen people do similar things. Yeah, I'm glad because, like, because uh, the thing is, is I didn't. I I was working full time and more than full time because I had a very selfish uh, coworker mm-hmm. who always seemed to get sick on Fridays and Saturdays, and so I was the one who had to fill in there. And I was also working on the last stages of the book. And uh, I got really screwed by that. And the book ended up getting published anyway. But the thing is, is now that I look at the shape that it's in, um, it's not that I wish I would have waited. I'm glad I I published. But the thing is, is it's just that, you know, people, uh, what is it? You can't, uh, you can't always mistake incompetence for evil. Sometimes people are just shits and they don't know they're being shits to other people. Uh, and so that's what I got. Uh, but yeah, but the, the thing is that I'm just going to, I'm just going to fix it and put it back out there again. That's not a bad thing, you know, re-releasing and whatnot. It's the term I would use at least, Yeah, you know, chance to connect with more people and build your following more and get your book out there more which is the ultimate goal yeah i'd like to um i'd like to save up for more advertising this time Mm -hmm. and pay for some make people a little bit more aware that it's coming yeah as as to both as opposed to just putting it out like the like friends and family and all of that you know people within my instagram and facebook circles knew that that it was coming out other than that i really want it wide wider spread Let's talk about your characters a little bit. Are they based off of people you've known, off of yourself, you know, that type of thing? Um, one thing I'll say is, like, the, the characters are not all of the same age. There's, a, like, a very wide demographic in where all roads lead, uh, like, people as young as uh, 17 years old and then all the way up to elderly. And the thing is, is I did draw from a lot of my own experiences in my stages throughout life yeah uh especially when it came to romantic attitudes the idea that that when i was 17 i didn't know what the hell i was doing and you know stepped on a lot of hearts and this that the other thing had mine broken many a time you know you go forward to one of his surrogate fathers that raised him on the adventuring road and he's got a romance happening at the same time and his attitude Mm -hmm. towards it is 100% 100% completely different than the boy. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, just taking that from my own experiences and and little snippets like there's a lot of there's a lot of work life going on in the village, so the different jobs that people do and so there's sort of some of it as snippets throughout from my own experience what these people are doing in their day-to-day jobs and that sort of thing. And then as well as that, there's also my experiences as a gamer uh, playing D and D. The first chapter of the book is literally the end that I played. I think it was a module called Keep on the Borderlands, one of the first modules for the original D and D game, mm-hmm. and it is literally the climax of the game. Then, yeah, like as far as experiences as a gamer. And the needs of characters within that world and things like elements like that, like lost a sword, get another one, that that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, what do you do without that thing? What is your attachment? D&D makes it really interesting when helping develop characters. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've done uh, looked into a lot of stuff when I'm writing my sci-fi fantasy series, and I always come to D&D for like the homebrew. It's kind of like I've seen like the guide sheets. Mm-hmm. You know, for the character development and then, like, just the different races that they involve. I think that's kind of something to build upon. If that makes yeah. sense. I, uh, oh, yeah, it makes absolute sense. Uh, the other thing is, is that I like to, uh, I like to take what I know of other people's fantasy worlds, uh, Tolkien, Feist, what have you, and, and just do something different. I guess in in my book, the some of the things are similar in that uh, the elves are very uh sexy and mix and mystical and that sort of thing but they the thing is is they intermingle with human beings without snobbery mm-hmm. uh they, you know and, the, and there's sort of like there's less of that sort of cast of interspecies racism that's sort of in there in token yeah. inadvertently uh or 
on purpose. I don't know. But the thing is, is I, one of the ways that I framed the story was, is that there was a war with the orcs 25 years ago and, uh, it sort of unites everybody, including the, the people from the orc country as well. Like the idea is, is that the, the, the nature of this calamity was so incredibly destructive that it's sort of like after world war two and the, uh, time period that the story is taking place in, uh, is sort of the 1950s of the yeah. world where everything is apparently been set to rights and people are just working on being happier and more self-satisfied and, and yeah. that sort of thing. So like the, the, the greatest conflict that they would ever know has already taken place as far as I know, I'm, I'm going to throw the gonna... meat, meat grinder in the, in the, oh, yeah. yeah, not maybe not in the next book, but maybe in the third one, I, uh, I've, I've thought about, uh, what can happen in book two and three. Those are just uh, story beats right now. I haven't started writing those at all. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess maybe it was because I felt like the, the first one needed that polish, uh, needed yeah. uh, people to uh, to be able to pick it up and go, holy, sh he spelled that wrong. Like, <laughs> like, do not see that on the printed page, right? Oh, uh, well, I mean, there's some books where... You know, you can tell it was an edited word, you know, the names, like there'll be one name for a certain character and then you go down a couple paragraphs and it, they didn't change the name. So it's like a different name, but they're still referring to the same character. Mm -hmm. They didn't catch it in editing. Have you seen that? No, not in mine, not in mine so far, but. Well, not in yours, but like in general reading. It's sort of hard to tell because like, again, it draws me back to Tolkien and the thing is, is he has. He has like 10, 12 names for every character and every object. And that's something that, again, that I wanted to work uh, uh, against. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody in my book has one name. Every place has one name. Every object has one name. Uh, I think that we hear four words of the Elfin language throughout the entire book. The rest is, you know, just if they mm -hmm. speak in their language it's it's in it's in uh prose it's in the paragraphs you know shimalina said in the old elvish tongue blah 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 blah, blah, blah. and instead of putting people through that and again like that's in the world building the author can can mess themselves up if they do that if they, if they create uh the whole new language yeah and all of these different names for everybody and that's uh, you reminded me of something i'm gonna have to uh, this pass on where all roads lead. So the thing is, is I'm going to have to go back in because I have to make sure there are two washerwomen in the village of Carlman's town. And one is the mother of a, of a secondary main character. And the other is just, we only see her in two scenes, but I want to make sure that, that I haven't switched their names. Oh no. <laughs> that I haven't, uh, that I haven't, uh, flip flopped what their names are at any point in time. So I'm literally going to have to go through the whole book. As soon as you brought that up, I started uh, thinking about it. Uh, yeah, I was like, oh. Uh, I know I've know. done reading on like just reading apps when I used to work outside of the home, just, you know, something quick and easy. And I'd see, you know, like, okay, so for like, let's say half the book, the person's name is Janine. Okay. And then you go farther back or for farther forward, whatever. And it's like a different name, but they're still talking about Janine. Just they didn't the thing is is I, I i would be critical of that but the thing is is i know that there are there are such glaring errors in all roads right now that that i that I, yeah you know just sort of hang my head and and throw in my lot with those people that have made those kind of errors and just, i think and we just, all have made some errors in our writing you know mm -hmm. and being accepting and looking to the future works to fix those errors mm -hmm. that makes sense well, yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Ian Ian Fleming, uh, Casino Royale, uh, he spelled Beretta wrong uh, throughout the entire book, and uh, his his publishers not being, you know, experienced with guns left it that way. I don't know throughout the entire book. So, like the first Bond novel, his gun is 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 spelled wrong throughout the entire book. Um, it happens, you know, and like the. Editing wise, like Fleming was a was a journalist after World War Two, mm -hmm. so he he knows about 
copy about about editing and that sort of thing and even someone that expert ends up making a mistake that large but you know it's also showing the humanity that like and you're gonna think this is weird but it's showing you know we're all human we all make mistakes Mm. every every single person and seeing a well-known author you know miss something or spell something wrong i mean instead of criticizing we can just be like oh hey look they're human too yeah, the uh, the the big sleep by uh, Raymond Chandler has a an unsolved murder in it. There's literally there's a uh, an extra dead body. Spade finds a body, and they're like, "Oh, geez, another clue. This has taken me down another avenue." And uh, they they never solve that. I'm sure it might be brought up again in the book, but it's just who who killed that person. We never know. We never find out. If you could share a piece of advice for an aspiring writer, what would it be? Do the writing, do the work. I meet a lot of people, and I'm older now. I'm 54, and I've met people ever since I was in my teens that would say, like, oh, I'm a writer, and they didn't do the work. They just literally never sat down. And, they never and, even started? or Yeah, pretty much. Like they're just, They just had the ambition because I, for some reason, uh, because I, I'm a, a screenwriter as well. Yeah. And it's worse for screenwriting than it is for prose. Uh, everybody, for some reason, thinks that uh, they're a screenwriter. And I'm, I'm like, no, no, you're not. That'd be like all of us saying like, oh, I'm an Olympic, you know, like every person just randomly on the street going, I'm an Olympic diver. And I'm it's like, like no, it's like, no, you're, you're not. So I, I would totally say to anybody who wants to start out writing is uh pay attention to the old scholastic rules like adjective order and that sort of thing like learn the rules of sentence structure for sure and, and pay attention to them like if you're going to break them break them because like you look at cormac mccarthy uh, you know he won his pulitzer for a book that you know hardly has any punctuation in it Pay attention to to like the old uh, structural textbooks. Was it Strunk and White's that kind of thing? Pay attention to those sort of things and read, read a yeah, lot. Yeah, read a lot, especially uh, not only inside but also outside of the the genre that you are wanting to focus on. Because it, like my first book is a is a fantasy book. Mm-hmm. But the but the approach to romance and sexuality come from life experience and also from other forms yeah. of writing. I find that that in uh, fantasy, I don't know why, unless it's Robert E. Howard or or some other offshoot of Conan, the approach to sexuality is as chaste as a Chinese movie. And I'm like, why? You know, like I I don't understand. Like you know, like there's yeah, like some people are like that, but why wouldn't there be other people who are just like Hey, you know, like it, yeah. I don't under I don't understand like why there is like this this monoculture when it comes to romance and sexuality across the board in fantasy. Like it's either uh, it's either super chaste or uh, super rapey. Graphic? Yeah, <laughs> like uh, like uh, uh, like those Death Stalker movies or whatever. You know, it's yeah. like it, it's either yeah, it's either really chaste or really rapey. Well, how about, you know, people who are just enjoying their sex lives or, uh, just you know, natural. Yeah. Just like natural romances as opposed to like the whole, I could not tell them before they went off to die. And I'm like, shut up, read outside of the genres that you want to write. Because the thing is, is like genre does get away with a lot of, uh, hmm, what's up? The, a lot of exceptions are made for, uh, lesser literary things going on within genre writing. If you read the first of the licensed uh, Star Trek novels that came out after the release of Star Trek, the motion picture, Mm -hmm. um, they were allowing any inexperienced fans to make submissions. Oh no. And the stories ended up being, some of them ended up being pretty damn good. Looks, I, yeah, like I own, I own some of those books. I think they're they're the stories are excellent. They know the characters very well. It's just that they don't know their writing. Again, to anyone who wants to wants to learn writing, don't be afraid to write fan fiction. Don't be afraid to to write fan fiction for whatever and just post it on uh, Tumblr. Even people are people are scrolling. They're, they're All looking. The time. 
Yeah, people are scrolling, they're looking at their art and their porn, and if they come across a story that's neat, then then they will. You know, they'll stop and read. Also, yeah, just don't get any life path locked in your head. That would be that would be number two. Is like, oh, that's I'm going like to good life lesson overall, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, just the idea that some people think that like once they write something, they're going to get an agent and they're or they're going to find a publisher and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and it's like it might and they're going to but, become but it probably won't like it probably won't happen and yeah just don't don't make plans for yourself make plans for your work and do the work Thanks. based on that planning and that sort of thing but otherwise what happens to it. You're kind of a leaf in the wind. Like once it's ready to publish, you're going to get pulled around in a lot of different directions. So where it lands is where it lands. You can, you can send things to certain publishers or even to certain film studios with intention. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get that intention. You know, sometimes it's a crapshoot and sometimes people say yes, but just don't get stuck in a, in a, in a pigeonhole of your own making. That's something yeah. I would very much say. Makes sense. All right. We are probably going to have to wrap up if you want to say anything else about your books or your writing. or. Um, well, I also, um, one thing I didn't mention at the beginning was is that I've got a couple of uh, horror stories. Okay. I've got a, a, a shocking coming-of-age horror story called Ripples, which is, uh, you know, how we see ourselves as kids and the beginning of teenage sexuality and then, and then how that can yeah. go into a very dark, dark direction it's written i owe very much style wise for that kind of stuff to stephen king because he captures young people very very well very very well and then there's another one which is kind of like another stephen kingish kind of story uh called minotaur and it's just about uh, a scared geeky little boy on his first paper route in a really bad neighborhood and having to collect from increasingly more monstrous characters. And so it's a short horror story, but it's also, uh, I, I like it. I think it's very interesting. It sounds uh, interesting for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the genres that I'll be, that I'll be concentrating on mostly is, is fantasy and uh, noir, with the detective fiction, and then branching off into horror. Yeah. I'm working on a new horror story right now. Yeah, I would say to anyone that uh, if they're interested in the world of where all roads lead, which is very immersive, like it's uh, written as though it's actually happening as opposed to some fantasy stories that kind of write almost in the form of myth. All right. Well, we'll make sure to have links to your book and social media posted with the podcast as well. Okay, thank you. Check it out. And... With that, I'm going to go ahead and close. And if you mind staying on for just a second afterwards, I want to mention something to you. But, okay. Okay. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Devin Richards, for being our guest today. We appreciate it. And we have loved hearing about your books and just your writing process and screenplays and everything in general. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much.